scripture tells us that God desires to transform each of us into a new creation. The work of transformation will only be done when we allow God to do it. There are some here today that have spent time searching tirelessly for purpose. You've tried to find it in the things of the world and you figured out you couldn't. Christ is the only one who can give you meaning and purpose. A life of faith. It is the best adventure you will ever take. Good morning. Wait, welcome to Waysburg Christian Church. We, uh, we get the privilege of serving and worshiping a loving God. Amen. We are going into our responsive reading this morning. And this morning, we're going to read again from Psalm 119. And we are on to verses 9 through 16. As always, I'll read what's in regular print up here. You guys read what's in bold, and then we'll finish the passage together. So if you wouldn't mind standing, as if you are able, as we read God's word. Amen. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your command. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as all I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, when you, you rescue us, you... You begin this process within us that takes every single one of us from where we were to a life that is secure and centered on you. It is true that you love us just the way that we are, but it is equally true that you love us too much to leave us that way. You gave your life, Lord, so that we could have ours. And it's not just a mediocre life that you've called us to, your desires that we live fully with you. Transformation is not easy. It's not quick. It's not an overnight process. It takes time, Lord. It takes dedication. It takes commitment on our parts. And so we can ask the question to you this morning, are we willing to partake in the process of transformation? Lord, I ask that you would point out the areas of our lives that you desire to transform and that we would prayerfully consider what needs to happen to allow us to follow you to the fullest so that you will do the work of transformation in those areas in our lives. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue our series this week uh, called Collide. And we kicked things off last week looking at the biblical principle of standing firm in our faith. Now, remember, the world attempts to offer us a different set of values, different than God's values. And these are values that include things that initially can be very, very seductive, but ultimately they are inconsistent and they are difficult, if not impossible, to stand on. So how do we pursue the things of Christ? We allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Spirit into all things truth. When we do, we will start to experience the abundant life that Christ came to give us. But how do we keep that experience going from day to day? And I believe that God ultimately desires three things, at least from us, as we move forward in life after we lay the foundation and we will move through these three things over the next few weeks. But the first one this morning that I want us to reflect on is being transformed. There was a family from an incredibly remote area of the world. They were making their first trip to the big city and they checked into this huge grand hotel and they stood in amazement at this impressive sight. Leaving the reception desk, they come to the elevator entrance. 
Now, they'd never seen an elevator before, and they just kind of stared at it, trying to figure out what it was. As they're looking, an elderly woman walks toward the elevator, and then the doors open, and she walks inside. The door closes, and about a minute later, the door opened, and out came a stunningly beautiful young woman. Dad could, the dad could not stop staring, and he reaches over without looking and pats his son on the arm and says, son, go get your mother. Okay, it's funny. (laughs) But scripture tells us that God desires to transform each of us into a new creation. The elevator in our little story here represents our sanctification. We, at the very moment we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we step into the elevator, wretched sinners, only to walk out as saints holy before God. Many of us have been tempted to follow the patterns of the world. We get caught up in sinful behavior that ultimately does not or cannot fulfill us, and nor does it glorify God. But God knows best. We cannot save ourselves. When we trust him, trust that he, God, is the sole agent of change, he transforms us into something beautiful. Romans 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so Paul, in this one verse, actually gives us an equation. There is a subtraction in this equation. Then there is an addition in this equation. And then there is a sum or an outcome in this equation. We'll break it down together. We're going to find the keys of transformation in our lives. The subtraction. No to the world. The first thing Paul invites us to do is simply say, no to the patterns of this world. And I'm a firm believer that in everyone's life, and we've talked about this in the past, there is a rhythm that we adhere to, a rhythm of some kind. Some of us have healthy rhythms. For instance, we wake up early each morning, we drink our cup of coffee, or three or four. We spend some time in God's word. We spend some time in prayer. Maybe we complete a morning workout and then we're off to work or school. For other of us, others of us, however, we may find ourselves caught up in unhealthy rhythms. My first semester of seminary, I was 13 years out of college when I was blessed and, and able to go to seminary. But I was a mess going in, an absolute mess. It had been 13 years. I schooling was a whole different thing. I had been working, doing all these things. I had a family now. I had a wife. I had two girls. I was completely stressed out. And I had allowed so much of the world in. I viewed success like the world. And according to the world, how I judged myself, well, I was a failure because the world said I was a failure. I hated my job. I wasn't reading God's word. I wasn't praying. I was waking up at 3.30 every single morning, completely riddled and filled with anxiety. And I couldn't go back to sleep. My rhythms were food, entertainment, whatever that was, TV, some hobby, whatever, go out with friends, do anything but face the issues that I was dealing with, acting a fool, Those became my rhythms. Those became my idols. And when I was in that season, I allowed the things of this world to lead me astray. I tried to find comfort where no comfort could be had. I was stuck in this ugly, unhealthy, rhythmic cycle, and I didn't know how to get out of it. I had hit a spiritual wall. 
in your life right now, maybe the first step we take towards transformation is for you to completely surrender your will to God. This is what he told me over time as I began to go to class again and read and kind of, I had to do prayer projects, so I had to pray. And as all that finally started to sink in over time, I realized that what God wanted from me was to surrender my will to him. Warren Wearsby, the pastor, commentator, theologian, his exposition of Romans, he says this, We surrender our wills to God through disciplined prayer. As we spend time in prayer, we surrender our will to God and pray with the Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. We must pray about everything and let God have his way in everything. Many of us have an unhealthy rhythm in our lives now because we have been, as Paul says, trying to copy the behavior and the customs of the world. When we have a rhythm in our life, we will be in some form or some fashion, we will be mirroring something else. We have a choice. Either we mirror the world and its values or we mirror our God and his. So Paul gives us the subtraction that has to take place in our lives. We have to say no to the world and its ways and its false comforts. And we have to surrender our wills 100% to God. And when we truly surrender our will to God, we are effectively then giving the resounding no to the world that Paul is talking about. Then there's an addition, and it's yes to the way. The way was the ancient way of describing Christianity. We were followers of the way. In the book, Invitation to a Journey, authors M. Robert Mulholland and Ruth Haley Barton Describe the biblical understanding of the process of spiritual formation over and against the self-help philosophies that are so prevalent in our day. They write, Scripture is also clear in its witness to the fact that only God can liberate us from our bondage, heal our brokenness, cleanse us from our uncleanness, and bring life out of our deadness. We cannot do it by ourselves. The spiritual formation is the experience of being shaped by God toward wholeness. But spiritual formation as being formed will also be seen to move against the grain of our do-it-yourself culture and our powerful need to be in control of our existence. Generally, we like to lift ourselves up by our bootstraps, Self-reliance is deeply ingrained in us. And to allow someone to control our life is seen as weakness. And it's to be avoided at all costs. The English poet William Henley captures the spirit of our culture when he wrote, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. But spiritual formation as being formed will reveal that God is the initiator of our growth toward wholeness. And this might sound familiar, our passage in Jeremiah a few weeks ago. The initiator of our growth toward wholeness, and we are to be pliable clay in God's hands. How then do we even get to the place where we can finally understand that God himself is the primary agent of our transformation Paul, he seems to know here, is concerned with how we think. Our thought process is important when it comes to growth, uh, growth potential in the kingdom of God. Oftentimes, when we are inundated, when we are completely saturated with the mind of the world, the temptation to follow worldly patterns and values, it becomes our home 
It becomes our habit. It becomes our rhythm. But the same is true for the patterns that Christ wants in our lives. Spending time reading and studying the Word of God, going to Him in regular prayer will give us the right type of thought processes. And it helps us respond well when we are confronted with worldly things. Our meditation of choice tends to be Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, anything but the Word of God. We are inundated with the world. I've said it, I've said it before, I'll say it again. We live in an age of over-information. We know too much of what is going on in the world, and it's maddening. It hurts. It's no wonder we are so depressed and so anxious all the time. The world hasn't changed that much. I know we think it has. There's always been war. There's always been violence. There's always been poor decisions. There's always been stupidity. There's always been rebelliousness against God. We are just more aware of it today than we ever have been in history. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better. These are the things that we almost inadvertently end up meditating on day and night. How do we think it's going to affect us? It's not going to be good. It's not going to be healthy. But... We can reason through that very same phenomenon that if what I am reading daily is the word of God and what I am doing is going to my knees every day and giving myself to him, submitting to him, allowing him to conform my will to his, well, that's a healthier rhythm. That is what can bring peace. That is what can bring, dare I say, joy in the midst of the chaos and the patterns of the world. We have to have a healthy routine and rhythm, something that we can enter into every single day. The Bible talks about it. Now, we've read Psalm 1 several times. I'm going to read the first two verses again this morning because David gives us an amazing example of what I just talked about. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. How do you do that? Verse 2, But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. If I want to be inundated with information, if I want to be saturated by something, I want it to be the word of God. David is a walking, talking example of the importance of meditating on God's word day and night. God desires that we not just have the word near us, but actually in us, in our minds, in our hearts, and exemplified through our lives. The work of transformation will only be done when we allow God to do it. And maybe something needs to change in your morning or your evening routines to allow God to transform you from the inside out. By what? By spending time with him. And by doing this, you have moved worldly distractions out of the way. And this allows God to come in and do a transforming work. And the transformation begins in your mind. Paul closes out our verse this morning with an outcome, a sum of this subtraction and addition that once we take these steps towards transformation, he says that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so the outcome is that we are hopefully able to discern our purpose. We know that, you know, Paul wrote this thousands of years ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, knows what we need even today. There are some here today that have spent time searching tirelessly for purpose in life. 
You've tried to find it in the things of the world and you figured out you couldn't. You've tried to find it in a relationship and you figured it out. You can't do it. You tried to find it by achieving a certain social media status or work status or school status and you figured out you couldn't do it. Christ is the only one who can give you meaning and purpose and identity in your life. The only one. And he has called you, all of you, to do great things for his kingdom right here on earth. He has given you gifts and abilities that no one else has for the building up of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But I wonder how many of us have yet to sense a calling from God because we've allowed our unhealthy rhythms to distract us from a relationship with him. We haven't been able to sense God's leading because we haven't spent any time with him. But the good news is this. There is still time right now to rewire your life. The Bible is riddled. It is full with instances where God makes it clear that there is still time to give him your life. Even the thief that was hanging on a cross next to Christ had time to receive eternal life. The prophet Joel says this, chapter 2, verse 12, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. All the way back in Old Testament, the Lord invites us to give him our lives. He invites us to run back to him in repentance. Jesus Christ came, was tempted by the same worldly things that every one of us are tempted by. And yet he was without sin. Ultimately, he dies on a cross for our sins so that we could be transformed into walking, talking reflections of him. You are not too far gone. You're not out of the game. Christ wants you back. He has a seat for you at the table. There's a book called The Relational Soul, Moving from the False Self to Deep Connection. It's by Richard Plass and James Cofield. And here's what they write about the attempt to rescue ourselves. The truth about significant soul transformation is this. Change is possible, but it is harder than we want. It takes longer than we expect. Real change requires more than willpower and easy, simple steps. We cannot rescue ourselves. There are no shortcuts. There are no easy paths. And there are no quick fixes. The more mature we are in our Christian faith, the more aware we are of the depth of change that is needed within our souls. From a practical point of view, anyone who has attempted to change harsh, negative self-talk, Reactive anger, feelings of worthlessness, a preoccupation with pornography, a persistent grumpy attitude, or persistent feelings of frustration understands the real, that real soul transformation is not simple. These last two sentences. If we are going to substantially change, listen to this. Something will have to die. But our false self, what is the false self? Fancy psychological term, meaning that self that we've built up, all of us, since we were kids as a defense mechanism. Every time we got in trouble, every time someone said you know, something mean to us, or maybe we were bullied, we created another self. It was a self that we believed, for our own protection, other people would like better than the real me. You can call it a mask. You can call whatever it is. 
It's not real. This is what they say. Something will have to die. But our false self never volunteers for its funeral. Stephen gets it. <laughs> Let that sink in. Let that sink in. It's not too late, folks. It's not too late. In fact, as long as you have breath in your lungs, it's never too late to make a profession of faith. For some today, whether you're here or online, it means returning to a faith and relationship that you've allowed to grow cold. You've allowed the distractions of, of life to collide with your faith and you felt distance from God for some time. But you haven't mustered up the energy to do anything about it. Today is your day. For some of you here, maybe online, this will be a new step of faith into a relationship that you've only heard others talk about. But now you're ready to make your own. And believe me, when I say that a life of faith is the most wild, amazing, grueling, beautiful, we can throw a thousand other adjectives in front of it. It is the best adventure you will ever take. And the eternal reward is worth every single moment. Amen. Not too hard to figure out what our scripture meditation is going to be this morning. It's going to be Romans 12 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so as we move into our short time of prayer, our meditation, Ask God, where in my life, Lord, am I being conformed to the world and not to you? Where, Lord, can I be transformed? What resistance am I putting up today that is keeping you from doing that work in me? And then ask, Lord, will you conform my will to yours. Let's take one, two minutes and lift this verse up to prayer. Lord, the fact is, Jesus, you are perfect. The perfect God, the Son, who came incarnate, fully human, fully God, lived a perfect life. And though, Lord, we cannot attain that in this life, we can be transformed and conformed into your likeness. And Father, that's what you do in us. That is the work of transformation and change that you do in us. But Lord, we have to seek you diligently. And I don't mean that in the kind of fleeting, somewhat, I'm just seeking kind of a, t I mean, we have to desire you. And we have to desire you, your commands, your rules, your precepts, Lord, more than we desire the world and its philosophies. It's, it's, it's tickling of the ear types of false prophecies, Lord God. It's false comforts. 
It's nonsense. We all get hammered by that stuff constantly, Lord. And oftentimes the result is is that we are not on our knees. For whatever reason, sometimes, Lord, we are just out of the habit and we constantly tell ourselves, oh, I'll pray tomorrow. Oh, gosh, I'll remember to pray tomorrow. Oh, yeah, I got to read that passage tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And then it's a year's worth of tomorrows and two years worth of tomorrows. And we're not on our knees. We are not praying. We are not talking to you. We are not sharing our lives with you. Even though we know you know where they are, Lord, we are not opening our mouths to confess to you what we are feeling. We are not being honest with you. And we are putting our trust in the world. And sometimes it's unintentional. Sometimes we don't necessarily mean to wake up in the morning and go, eh, I'm going to ditch God and I'm just going to do this. That's not always how it works. The world, our culture, tends to seep in little by little over time. And the next thing you know, it's a flood of human tradition. It's a flood of little quips to make you feel good for a moment. It's a flood of all kinds of temptations and sin, Lord God. And so we need you. We have to say no to those things. We have to say yes to you, Lord God, and know and trust that you, as the agent of transformation, of change in our lives, that you will work in our hearts. Sometimes we're just scared. We think we've done something so bad that we can't be forgiven. But you say, come to me. Run back to me. It is never too late. And if there is anyone here who does not know you or anyone online who does not know you, Lord, the same goes for them. It is not too late. You are not so bad that I cannot love you. I love you. Come to me. And you will begin that work of transformation, Lord. Help us, Lord. Conform our wills to yours. May we submit to you with all that we are, body and spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Psalm 121, verses 7 through 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going, or keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. Please join us for fellowship. Remember to bug the missionaries in the house, uh, ask some questions, and uh, God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Tomorrow night, Celebrate Recovery Tuesday, we have prayer. Watch the website. Amen.